And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our third speaker and a dear friend, uh, Volodymyr Dubovik, who comes to us from Odessa, Ukraine, well, most immediately from Austin, Texas, but originally from Odessa, Ukraine. And I was also thrilled to learn that uh, Volodymyr is a long time friend of KU, that this is actually his third visit to our campus, and he's a long-term friend of our center. So we go way back. So his first visit uh, to KU happened during the directorship of Professor Paul Danieri, and his second visit happened during the directorship uh, at Crease by Professor Eric Heron. So we are delighted to welcome him back, and we look forward to his presentation today, as well as his fascinating, I'm sure, uh, brown bag presentation tomorrow at 12 noon at a regular Chris venue in 318 Bailey Hall on U.S.-Ukrainian relations uh, under the Trump administration. I'm sure it's going to be uh, a lot <laughs> to learn and a lot to discuss. So please join me in welcoming Professor Volodymyr Dubovic. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Vitaly, not just for introducing, introducing me in such a uh, nice uh, way, but also for hosting me and, and showing all your hospitality. Uh, indeed, I've been here to Lawrence before a couple of times, but uh, last time was a long time ago, so I always uh, was looking for, in recent years, uh, for a chance to revisit, and what's a better chance, uh, opportunity to revisit than uh, having a good friend of mine being now based here, Vitaly Chernyevsky, here in Lawrence. So I would like to uh, express my thanks to everyone here uh, at Chris, uh, to Bart Redstone as well, who took care uh, so diligently of uh, our logistics uh, uh, related to my visit. Um, and I would like to thank Fulbright as well, <laughs> because I'm a Fulbright scholar and uh, you know what, uh, Fulbright is a great experience and that's my second Fulbright actually here in this country of the United States and I've been involved in the Fulbright community for years now uh, and that's one of the few uh, programs there remaining uh, funded by US government and uh, hopefully in this uh, difficult uh, times uh, when so many great things uh, are seem to be falling under the axe of uh, you know budget reductions uh, there would be still things like Fulbright and many more uh, other programs, uh, perhaps, for people from this country to visit and go outside of the U.S., and also for people like myself uh, to come and do our research and teaching here in the uh, uh, in United States. I am, for this academic year, indeed based in Austin, Texas, where I do some research and also do teach a course in this semester specifically on Ukraine. Uh, so that's an interesting experience, and I have 20 students there down in Austin, uh, and my course is called Ukraine Contemporary Challenges and Issues, so it's a broad kind of course on all sorts of economic, political, security challenges that Ukraine is facing specifically now in the last three years, three plus years and so on. I should also dis uh, make a disclaimer that I've never before truly approached the subject uh, of migration or immigration uh, at the conferences or in my own personal research. But um, as I sat down, uh, yesterday and today in the morning before the conference, and I thought about this subject. I was uh, stunned myself on how many actually, how many issues there, how many angles are there, and how many aspects are there related that that, that connect Ukraine, Ukraine situation on one hand, and the, and and then the whole subject uh, and the whole field of studies uh, related to migration or immigration and things like that. I would start. Uh, by saying that, of course, Ukraine, just by the virtue of its uh, geopolitical situation, uh, is, used to be a zone of um, people coming through for centuries, I would say. Uh, you know, Ukraine is a country in between. Ukraine is a country at the edge. You know, Ukraine has often been referred to as a country, as a, as a country bridge, connecting something, supposedly. Uh, then Ukraine is often seen as a battleground state as well, specifically in the last three years. Uh, a buffer state. So, I mean, all of those definitions, if you apply them to Ukraine, uh, that, me, that immediately brings to your attention uh, the question like, it must be something dealing with things like migration, and, and it does. Uh, 
Uh, Ukraine uh, is part of the Black Sea region, of course. Why the Black Sea region, which is one of the most uh, uh, intensive areas in terms of uh, uh, people moving through, and also illegal trafficking people as well for years, uh, people coming all the way, all sorts of directions, actually. Uh, Ukraine is also there um, experiencing a lot of problems in terms of lacking proper uh, uh, proper governance to deal with uh, many issues related to migration, I should say. Uh, a lot of times, and up to, to the present times, I would say, uh, Ukraine was lacking uh, proper legislation uh, uh, in order to deal with issues related to migration. Uh, the whole uh, case of migration still appears somehow to our legislators and also people in the executive branch as something new, something which we shouldn't properly be doing with because it's not about us, it's about some other countries and regions, but it is about Ukraine. So I guess there should be a lot of catching up uh, needs to be done by Ukrainian uh, parliament and also government uh, in terms of a better approaching and more effectively approaching uh, the issues related to migration. Um, a lot of people were coming through Ukraine over the last uh, decades since the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, we hear often about the, the, the Syrian migrants and people from broader Middle East coming to Europe uh, via Turkey and then Greece and so on. We hear a lot about Africans coming f uh, through uh, Libya and then, you know, southern Italy and so on. But uh, yet apparently over years, a lot of the people from both Asia and Africa, they've, for some reason, they've chosen to try and get into Europe through Ukraine. Or maybe they had to, maybe they didn't have other choice. I didn't specifically study that uh, issue. Why would they decide to try and get into Europe via Ukraine, uh, considering that uh, if you look at the map, maybe there is a shorter route or something. But we should also remember that, you know, the Turkey, for instance, is just a more or less recent uh, phenomenon that the Turkey would be allowing all those people to come through Turkey into Europe. So that wasn't there even several years ago. So maybe that's why Ukraine and other places in post-Soviet space were chosen as some alternative routes to get to Europe. Some of them got to Europe. Uh, a lot of them smuggled in Europe, in, of course, in, in human conditions often and so on. But some don't, and they, which means they, many of them stuck in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, the number of those people are actually growing, uh, of those people in Ukraine who are uh, never designed, never intended to be living in Ukraine for a long period of time, reasonably, relatively lo long period of time, but now they do, uh, because they are not willing to go back to their homelands uh, for various reasons, economic, uh, you know, political persecution, combination of both, and maybe more. Uh, and at the same time, they couldn't get to, to Europe anymore, and also the capacity of Europe, the capability of Europe to absorb more of those migrants is, is, is limited, perhaps, to some extent, so they understand that as well. So we're seeing more and more of those people who got stuck in Ukraine for some reason, including in the streets of my hometown of Odessa. And actually outside of Odessa, there's one of the biggest, largest detention centers, or for, for the lack of the better uh, term to describe it, uh, that's what it is. You know, I've never been there, but I know it's there, and I see more and more faces of people who are presumably uh, staying there, but they are not uh, limited in their movement around the region or the city, so they show up in the city of Odessa and I often see them. And actually, in where, where I live, when I often took this uh, local minivan kind of taxi, the Marshrutka, towards my well, going to my, towards my home, they, I often see in that minivan a lot of those people who are presumably going to that detention center where they're supposed to spend nights and everything, uh, because it's in the same direction, uh, you know, outside of outside of Odessa. Uh, so that's a new phenomenon, and of course, you know, the people in Ukraine, they're not necessarily prepared to face that kind of um, influx, maybe not drastic or dramatic influx of people coming to, to Ukraine. Uh, and I never thought of Ukrainians as, a, uh, you know, ultimately or, um, you know, super xenophobic people, but there is a certain amount of xenophobia, and clearly a lack of preparedness of seeing people who look very much different to the most... To, to the way most Ukrainians uh, look like in terms of their, you know, skin of, uh, you know, color of their skin and other things and traditions and everything. But, but now, of course, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, work being done in terms of trying on, of somehow integrate those people and provide them with basic services. And uh, again, the state and the government is probably lacking 
in that particular respect, but then there are NGOs, uh, some of the local NGOs in Ukraine, some of the international organizations funding those activities, including, uh, for instance, the George Soros uh, Foundation in Ukraine, the Renaissance Foundation, uh, which is doing some work and issuing some grants to the NGOs that are specifically targeting uh, people coming uh, to Ukraine and living in those detention centers in various places around Ukraine uh, who are in a diff difficult situation. They're basically stuck there, but it looks like they'll be with us in Ukraine for a while. So we need to help those people, and uh, many of them have families and healthcare concerns and, you know, educational needs uh, and looking for jobs as well. So, I mean, of course, Ukraine is not capable financially by itself to just provide for those people. So we're also looking for financial assistance coming from outside of Ukraine uh, to provide for those people. So that's an interesting uh, uh, aspect there. Uh, we see those people, but we are not probably, we're only early on that uh, path of trying to integrate those people and make their life less miserable uh, in the country of Ukraine, which is a difficult uh, task and a challenge for a country which is uh, facing quite a few challenges itself and, uh, and the budget is not necessarily full uh, <laughs> and uh, there are many concerns and uh, you know we are getting a lot of financial assistance from international communities these days uh, ourselves so um, uh, not to mention that we need to deal now with this situation as well now the people were coming to ukraine from other places in the post-soviet space the people were coming like i said just um, minutes ago from outside of the uh, soviet union as well and then of course there were a lot of ukrainians who were also going outside of Ukraine, uh, some in the other republics form of Soviet Union has been mentioned by both previous presenters, uh, some of course, uh, uh, you know, way to the West, to the Europe, United States and Canada and so on. But even um, prior to 1991, uh, the dissolution of Soviet Union, there, were, there was some internal kind of migration there. For instance, there was a major wave of migration since the horrific uh, uh, earthquake in Armenia in, er, in late 1980s, I believe it was 1988, maybe 1989 or something, I might be, might be not remembering correctly, and I remember a lot of people came from Armenia specifically to my hometown of Odessa, which was also, there's a specific case with Odessa because Odessa was also known as a super hospitable place, an open place, and people been kind of openly minded to the whole idea of embracing more people in. And, and, and basically, you know, kind of inviting them in. And Odessa was been multi-ethnic multi ever since its inception, really. Inception, really. And uh, that's one of the reasons, one of the factors why a lot of those people were actually coming to Odessa uh, over the years or decades even. Uh, there was uh, some effect of a Chernobyl disaster when people had to relocate from. Uh, from an area affected by Chernobyl uh, disaster, they also moved to various places outside, I mean, in Ukraine, including including Odessa. And then, of course, there was also so-called hot conflicts then that became frozen conflicts, which is not a very good uh, uh, term, and a lot of experts, most experts now, uh, you know, think it's not a proper, proper term, really, frozen conflicts, but uh, all of them, Transnistria, both uh, uh, related to Georgia and uh, the Azeri-Armenian conflict uh, as well, they all affected Ukraine to some extent because a lot of people came into Ukraine escaping the violence in those countries, uh, particularly Transnistria, uh, you know, if not escaping the violence, but then definitely looking for uh, more universities where you can get your degree, better job situation. Uh, they were coming to Ukraine, they were coming to Odessa, and of course in Odessa region, which is right there, next to Transnistria, and that's the largest by far uh, administrative territorial unit within Ukraine. Uh, you had uh, a lot of people uh, coming from Transnistria uh, e e e e into Ukraine. So that was another experience. And then, uh, not just from South Caucasus, since I've mentioned uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and, and Georgia, but also from Northern Caucasus, some people were coming into Ukraine, specifically the Chechens. Uh, and I remember clearly, for instance, there was a huge wave of Chechen immigration. I mean, by huge, I mean, relatively speaking, that's not a huge numbers, but noticeable number of people coming from Chechnya in the 1990s, uh, even after the first, uh, you know, Chechen war, so to speak, uh, when the uh, former mayor of Odessa, Eduard Hurwitz, when he was uh, in his first coming to become a mayor, to be a mayor of Odessa, he invited quite a few Chechens into Odessa, and they came, and uh, with them came some of the Chechen mobsters as well. So actually, Mr. Gurus was often, uh, you know, criticized and, and uh, heavily, heavily battered for this uh, idea of inviting such um, some Chechens in. But 
many of them, most of them were actually just, just very nice people and they just stayed in Odessa and never returned to Chechnya. So that's interesting. Then there was, of course, the Syrian crisis, which is ongoing for a number of years now, and uh, even prior to, chronologically speaking, the Syrian crisis started, of course, uh, before the whole Ukraine-Russia conflict started. Uh, so the Syrians are coming to, to Ukraine in, a, in certain numbers, not in massive numbers, but they do. Even prior to the conflict, a lot of Syrians liked coming to Odessa. Uh, but that was more of a situation when you would have some students coming to get their degree in Odessa and then for, for various reasons deciding to stay. Uh, so we had a noticeable community of Syrians, Lebanese and some others in Odessa. Uh, but now, since they, they have a war ongoing, the, the, the number of Syrians coming to, to Ukraine, uh, and including Odessa, is actually increasing. And there are all sorts of discussions like what do you do with them? Should we actually offer them uh, better conditions now and invite some more of those uh, uh, refugees or not? Uh, a lot of people would argue that we are dealing with a lot of issues on our own plate, so we couldn't really afford to invite some of those Syrians. Uh, but then others say, well, we should probably, you know, try and, and invite some of them. And uh, there's dis there are discussions, like I said, the legislation is not on the proper level to address those issues. There are all sorts of speculations, like, for instance, Russian propaganda would also try uh, and, uh, uh, and scare Ukrainians uh, about this possibility of hordes of Syrians coming in. Uh, and you would uh, uh, occasionally read some of those articles online, like the Turkish government or maybe European Union uh, making this uh, uh, discreet deals, uh, some kind of confidential agreement with the Ukrainian government, and deciding on placing a lot of those Syrian refugees uh, in, in Ukraine without knowledge of the Ukrainian public, without any kind of con public control or transparency, something like that. And most of that, of course, is not true. Uh, quite recently, there have been a major, some major agreements being signed by Ukrainian government on one hand and Turkish on the other, and immediately you had a whole bunch of publications basically saying, oh, you know what, there, is, there will be this major detention areas in various parts of Ukraine where the Syrians would be coming now because Turks want to get rid of them, and Europeans are not necessarily, I mean, it varies from country to country, as you know, but uh, many countries in Europe are not uh, happy in terms of inviting those Syrians in. So, and even to the extent that some would speculate that the, the price for Ukrainians to get the, the right to travel into Europe without visas was for Ukraine to co to, to coalesce and, and to, you know, to agree and uh, to this condition of hosting some of those uh, migrants and uh, refugees coming from the greater Middle East, which is not true. I mean, uh, if Ukraine as a country and the government of Ukraine and the public discussion would lead to such a conclusion that we would like to see some of those people uh, coming into Ukraine and we are ready to welcome them in Ukraine, that's another thing. But uh, nothing in terms of some of those uh, separate or uh, secret or confidential deals or agreements being signed, uh, nothing of that is true. Now, another thing that I would like to talk about briefly is uh, that, of course, <clears throat> Ukrainians were always uh, going to Europe in big numbers uh, over the years, even prior to this current situation that we have uh, with the discussions on uh, visa-free uh, regime for Ukrainians to go to, to, to Europe. Uh, there are all sorts of numbers. Uh, of course, it's, it's in all those cases, many of them illegals. So it's very difficult to actually provide some um, you know, trustworthy numbers in terms of how many Ukrainians actually went over years to, to Europe. Uh, they went primarily from the western Ukrainian uh, regions, western regions in Ukraine, where you actually have most uh, uh, difficult situation and harsh situation in terms of uh, you know, not enough jobs and things like that. Uh, uh, in terms of where they went in Europe, that also differed basically all over Europe, but uh, uh, preferably in many cases to the countries of southern Europe. So another problem there was uh, when the, the, the economic crisis of 2008 uh, hit hard, uh, the most uh, vulnerable, uh, uh, the most impacted uh, countries were exactly those countries in uh, southern Europe of Spain and Portugal and Greece and Italy, and, they, and those were their areas where most of the Ukrainians actually went. Uh, and uh, therefore, even you had a lot of people returning uh, into Ukraine because they just couldn't find enough jobs anymore in some of those countries, the economies of which were booming, specifically of Spain, right on the, on the eve of the crisis, when the crisis hit. Uh, you know, in Spain, there's a huge unemployment situation with uh, lots of locals, so let alone Ukrainians, so many of them returned. 
uh, there was an interesting gender factor here too. I didn't think about it until I listened to the previous presentations. Uh, uh, most of the people, uh, bulk of the people of Ukrainians who go to Europe are, are women. Uh, because they're not working construction business, they're working mostly as a nannies, uh, nursing, uh, you know, housekeepers and things like that. And, and to the extent that in many countries in Europe, it's uh, Ukrainian nannies and, uh, are, are, are known as the best you can get somehow. And the, somehow the price that you pay to have a Ukrainian woman taking care of your kids and the family is higher you know, relatively, in com if you compare it to the price that he would pay for a nanny coming from some other country, I wouldn't. I mean, I wouldn't really know like wh wh what drives this, but that's that's the case. So that's interesting. But and then, of course, if you talk about the people who are coming to say to Russia, Ukraine is going to Russia, were there. That's primarily, uh, you know, men because they would work in construction business and agriculture and everything like that. Uh, but also services and restaurants as well. But but in Europe, it's primarily women. So that's interesting. And then, of course. Most of those people don't have this uh, plan to stay there forever, or permanently. Uh, quite often, they would just go and uh, you know and send some honey, some money home, and but also eventually would they are planning to come back home. I mean, that's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, I think in terms of thinking about their kids and grandchildren, a lot of those Ukrainians who go to Europe, uh, they would uh, probably think about those options hard. If I have enough money for my kids to go to university in Europe and get a degree there, that's a good thing. But me, you know what, I'm a Ukrainian, I'm, I'm just here because the circumstances brought me here, and I'm planning to go back to my hometown and my village. And, and most of Ukrainians, I, what, what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing, are uh, th this way, you know, so there's no desire necessarily to move permanently to Europe and stay there for, among a lot of those people who are working in Europe. So now, of course, there is a, there is a visa-free arrangement uh, uh, which is looming uh, um, and appearing as something realistic uh, before us. And uh, just a few days ago, there was a vote in European Parliament, of course, I think last Thursday or so. Uh, which was by a vast majority of votes there uh, supported the idea that Ukraine should get, uh, Ukrainians should get this uh, right to travel into Europe without visas. And this issue has been discussed there uh, for a number of years, of course, uh, and we in Ukraine, we've been waiting uh, impatiently, I would say, to some extent, uh, uh, for this decision to be made. In fact, there have been several steps towards this. Uh, there have been a roadmap agreement signed by Ukrainian government and European Union where you would have some conditions and requirements that Ukraine need to fulfill and meet uh, before this decision is going to be made. And we fulfilled some of those, uh, you know, most of those, uh, according to the European inspection teams coming to Ukraine and, and looking at how Ukraine performed on those uh, roadmap conditions. We've perform we fulfilled those and we implemented those. And uh, yet there were many delays, you know, and Ukraine has become in a way a victim of this uh, growing xenophobia and the, and the whole fear of immigrants coming into Europe. Unfortunately, so the discussion about Ukrainian visa-free regime uh, coincided in time with uh, these big numbers of Syrians and other Middle Easterns coming into Europe. So a lot of public in various European countries was not necessarily uh, favorable and open to this idea, you know, of opening any uh, other tracks uh, and allowing uh, people from countries like Ukraine uh, to come without visas. But that, but it looks like we're gonna have it soon. But it doesn't mean that we. We're going to have this, all these problems uh, resolved. Uh, there are some risks. Uh, there are some uh, maybe unrealistic expectations there. In terms of risk, uh, I follow discussion in, in Ukrainian media and, and social media as well. And I can see that a lot of people are afraid that now the, uh, that there will be, a, if, if before the humiliation for Ukrainians applying for European visas was uh, centered specifically in, uh, in the consulate sections of various embassies in Kiev or elsewhere, visa application centers, including some in, in you know, Odessa, for instance. Uh, now a lot of people expect that accumulation to be happening at the border. So a lot of people say all of these uh, papers that we have to you know, show to, to apply for our visas, now we would have to show all those papers at the border. So somehow uh, people believe and are afraid and uh, until we actually get into this mode of, of moving across the border, we would know for sure 
how it's going to look like, but, uh, but a lot of people and experts on, on this issue they would say, no, of course you would need to have on you a certain amount of papers showing why are you going to a certain country, what is the term of your visit, uh, your hotel reservation, you, you know, your, your air flight or train tickets. Uh, you would need to show this, but you also need to show this when you come to a country, uh, you know, when you have a visa and you also visit a country, you're often asked, you know, like if you come to the U.S., what's the reason for your visit, stuff like that. So it's not really unusual uh, in many respects, but some people expect it to be a problem. And then, uh, of course, uh, uh, part of that agreement with the EU that we are now uh, going to have soon, I suppose, and I hope so, is that there might be a termination of the hall. Uh, format of visa-free regime, uh, but uh, um, you know, so we need to study perhaps better and more what could be the conditions on which the European Union governing bodies might decide, for whatever reason, that they would like to terminate this kind of agreement with Europe, with, with Ukraine. So that's another thing. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there is a politicization of this issue uh, on both sides, actually. In the European Union, of course, there was a lot of this right-wing forces, for instance, primarily, who are not happy about this whole agreement, and uh, also uh, far left as well, but because, of course, uh, uh, all of this is seen through the prism, through the lens of, of Ukraine-Russia conflict, which is ongoing for three years now. So uh, a lot of friends of Putin on both uh, uh, you know, extreme right and, and extreme left they're not happy, and uh, we've seen the discussion in the European Parliament and, and people coming from both of those fringes uh, coming together, uh, you know, and that's not surprising, and that's not a new phenomenon. Uh, you know, some experts already came up with this notion of a brown-red coalition there on Ukraine crisis. Uh, in, in Europe and elsewhere in the West, uh, when you have this far left and far west and far right meeting quite often in terms of how they see situation in Russia and Putin and, and Russian intervention in Ukraine and things like that. But luckily enough, they've been in an in a absolute minority there in the European Parliament. But, uh, you know, we'll see how that develops in, in, in the coming years. In Ukraine, there's also politicization because there is the position now in Ukraine. Uh, and those uh, people are saying that we don't like the current government and we expect the current government uh, to show this visa-free regime as a major achievement and, and therefore we should probably deny them an opportunity to, to present it as their own achievement and therefore we should be critical perhaps or that achievement for the whole of Ukraine that now Ukrainians would be able to visit without uh, visas and come to European Union countries, Schengen zone. So there is a whole politicization issue there uh, through the prism also of internal domestic Ukrainian political discourse. Uh, and uh, whether you're with Poroshenko, the current president, or not, you know, whether you're opposing him on, and on which grounds and things like that. So that's interesting. And then, of course, the big issue is there, will there be a substantial influx of uh, Ukrainians coming into Europe uh, when we uh, have this visa-free thing uh, already implemented and uh, the most realistic assumption uh, tell us that maybe even as soon as mid-June of this year, Ukrainians would be capable of uh, traveling without visas into European Union. Uh, Georgians just got a little bit lucky and ahead of us, and they can travel to European Union since the end of March. So basically just, you know, quite recently. Uh, now we are a little, 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 little lagging behind, even though we've been kind of uh, together in the same package for quite a long time, Georgians and Ukrainians in that particular respect. So would there be a huge uh, uh, influx? And, the, and, and experts uh, differ on this, and uh, we would, there's no way of knowing until we actually see what happens when the borders are open. Um, you know, first of all, it's important to understand, and, and, and I believe some Ukrainians still don't get it, that the visa-free doesn't mean that the people can actually come and, uh, and work in the countries of the European Union. The visa-free doesn't mean that you would get uh, the permit to work. It's very different, you know, and uh, there is a certain phenomenon, of course, of ways of replacement and labor force that takes place in Europe. You know, you had all of the Eastern Europeans coming to Western Europe, uh, you know, you had all this care of Polish plumber coming, you know, plumber coming, plumber coming to, 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 to London, say, and, uh, you know, stealing all those jobs from British workers and stuff like that, which didn't really, you know, materialize, as you know. Uh, there have been a lot of people coming to Western Europe, but not to such an extent that there'll be no jobs for locals. And, but, you know, still, convincingly enough for people to vote for Brexit, that's another story. Um, but then uh, some of those Eastern Europeans actually went to Western Europe, which means that in some cases they even had a shortage of labor force. 
Uh, and there you have Ukrainians and Belarusians, maybe Moldovans, uh, who would be coming to, to replace those. So there is a phenomenon and there is a certain logic to it. And, uh, you know, I don't see anything sp specific or unusual about it. Uh, uh, economy is a driver here, mostly. It's not really a political decision, you know. It's the same way as it is here in the U.S. in many respects, you know. I mean, that a lot, many, many of the local people, you know, that the, 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 the wouldn't take certain jobs, and therefore you would have someone coming from outside and taking those hard jobs, and that's how it is. And you begin to depend on those people very much so, and that reminds me of this uh, pretty good movie, maybe not as a, as a piece of cinema, but uh, quite instructive, which was called A Day Without a Mexican. Uh, you know, what happens if suddenly Americans wake up one day and there are no Mexicans around? And that, that's going to be basically a paralysis, <laughs> clearly in many, many regions around this country. Uh, and the same thing is happening in Europe. You know, you, you need the, this influx, this kind of come, uh, you know, this kind of stream of people coming because you need that labor uh, labor force coming in. So the same thing is going to be with with, uh, with uh, Eastern Europe and Ukrainians coming. But what, what publications I've seen among the people who are actual experts on the issue, they do not expect a massive move of Ukrainians. One of the things you should keep in mind that a lot, a lot of Ukrainians are already there, illegally. You know, that might, you know the visa-free thing might change something for them, obviously. Uh, but uh, a lot of people who never considered going to Europe or Eastern Europe or anywhere in Europe to work there outside of Ukraine, they wouldn't consider doing it even now because, you know, mostly the people who are cheering right now and celebrating, people like myself, you know, because uh, just to apply for a visa to go in conference in Europe, it's been a pain in a certain, you know, part of your body and, uh, uh, you know, and uh, it's, it's been problematic. I've been myself in the many situations in the past when I would get an invitation to come for a conference in Europe and I would basically sit down and think, you know, whether it's such a great conference and I really need to attend it, uh, that would validate for me this decision to go through those collecting all these papers and making this trip to overnight train ride to Kiev and standing in the line and, and, ex and experiencing some of those humiliation from a clerk in the window on the consular section and then maybe waiting on my passport, maybe even needing to make another train ride to Kiev to pick up my passport. Uh, you know, so that, that's it. And also a lot of middle class people, friends of mine in the business community who said, you know what, I'm a busy person. I cannot, you know, take my time from my business to spend on collecting all these papers and applying for visa. So instead I'll just make another trip maybe to Egypt or Turkey since they don't require us to have visas. And I'll spend, you know, uh, with my family, I spend a nice time on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea in Turkey or Red Sea in Egypt instead. Uh, I would love to go to, you know, Berlin or Paris or Vienna, but I just don't have enough time to deal with all those papers. So those primarily are the, actually the audiences, those target groups in Ukraine that would definitely benefit from this visa-free visa -free regime, uh, to my, to, you know, in, in my view, in my view. And then, of course, the situation in Ukraine will affect, uh, uh, you know, how much immigration we, we're going to see, how much of Ukrainians moving out. We'll see if the situation stabilizes, if there are some uh, uh, successes and achievements in fighting corruption, uh, if uh, Ukrainian economy is doing better, then of course there is less of incentive of Ukrainians, for Ukrainians to, to move out and, you know, to be outside of, and looking for a job outside of uh, Ukraine. If not, you know, if something alternative happens and if we continue to drag uh, with reforms and everything like that, then of course uh, there will be, of course, a lot of incentive for Ukrainians to look for jobs outside of Ukraine. Most finally, of course, just a few words about the impact of the crisis, uh, the Russia-Ukraine crisis, uh, the conflict, uh, which in, uh, originally has been a Ukrainian conflict and domestic Ukrainian uh, conflict, but then it got internationalized, specifically with Russian intervention, so the proper way now to, to address it would be perhaps the crisis over Ukraine. Uh, in many ways similar to what it was with Kosovo in 1999. We refer to the crisis over Kosovo. So now it's a crisis over Ukraine because there's so many international players are, and actors are involved. Uh, the Crimean aspect of it I'm going to leave out of my talk because I'm getting close to the time, to the limits uh, uh, of my uh, presentation and also because the next speaker, uh, Austin Sharon, is going to be speaking specifically about the situation uh, in, uh, you know, specifically about how the Crimean annexation affected, uh, you know, uh, lives of some of Crimean citizens and things like that. Uh, so on Donbass, of course, you, 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 Ukraine is now uh, familiarizing itself with the whole notion of what internally displaced person is, 
because of course until quite recently most of Ukrainians had no idea of obviously uh, was what, what would IDP mean but now we're having those people in vast numbers uh, living in Donbas uh, and we are learning that we now we need to do something about them and of course some of them left for Russia for various reasons uh, closer open borders expectation that the social payments like pensions and, 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 and salaries in Russia will be higher, that the Russian state was going to be picking up endlessly uh, the, the bill for them staying in Russia. Many of those expectations already turned out to be uh, you know, wrong, and a lot of people already regret uh, them being in Russia and thinking about ways of getting back to to Ukraine. But there are many, of course, many of those people who are from Donbass, they left to, to, for, for, for the rest of Ukraine. Uh, not for places outside of Ukraine at all, because there is a consensus among the European Union countries that you, uh, most of the people from Donbass, they do not qualify as refugees because Ukraine is a big country and the conflict only uh, encompasses this little segment of land in the far east of Ukraine. So there is a huge areas outside of the conflict uh, area and that uh, Ukraine should be capable of, by itself to accommodate those people. So people, a lot of, most of the people who were from Donbass and they were applying for the refugee status and going into Europe, they were declined. You know, they said, you're just not refugees, go back to your home country. You know, we, we, we're sorry that you had to leave your home, but uh, otherwise you'll be able to find your new location, housing and jobs within Ukraine. Uh, so Ukraine is learning how to deal with it, and uh, of course the wealthier people moved out from Donbas uh, the first, but then others followed. Uh, there are various attitudes among them. I mean, the people who are coming from Donbas to other parts of Ukraine, the attitudes in terms of who are they blaming for their, you know, faith and uh, what the situation that they found themselves in, and their expectations of what they should be provided with, and the feeling of entitlement as well. Some people have done research on this already, like a good friend of mine and colleague, like for instance, Marta Dichok from uh, University of Western Ontario in Canada. She's done a lot of interviews with those people and she said, she told me that they really differ in terms of, uh, many of them actually blame Ukrainian government for starting the whole anti-terrorist operation in Donbass, others not. Some of them think that they should be actually looking actively for the jobs themselves. Others say, well, you, you put us in such situation, you meaning government of Ukraine, of Russia, whoever, so you should be uh, uh, responsible for providing me with a new job or something like that. So, so the all, whole sorts of attitudes and expectations and, and various degrees in terms of feeling of entitlement for something among many of those people. And there is some discrimination, of course, uh, 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 towards those people in various ways. Uh, for instance, in housing. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's well known that a lot of people in Ukraine are not necessarily eager to rent out to the people from Donbas. Uh, so when you show your passport and it says that you're registered in Donbas, you often turn away, you know. Uh, n not necessarily for some kind of political or geopolitical reasons, but primarily because uh, a lot of uh, landlords, they would understand these people are limited in, in, in the amounts of money that they have on them. So what happens if they have the rent for the coming months but not beyond and are gonna be having difficulties in uh, evicting uh, those uh, tenants. So that's the primary consideration. There have been a lot of information uh, in the social media, in the press, in Ukraine, how the people from Donbass would try to rent a house or an apartment or a room in the apartment and they would be turned away because uh, people would say, well, you know what, oh, are you from Donbass? No, no, my, my apartment is not for you. So that's a difficult situation there. Uh, Odessa actually accommodated quite a few of those, specifically in 2014 when the conflict was fresh. Um, in the summer of 2014, a lot of this Soviet uh, style and Soviet era uh, spa resorts outside of Odessa on, on the Black Sea coast were accommodating people coming from Donbass, and many of them are still there. You know, that's, that's it. Uh, interestingly enough, that because of the tragic events in Odessa on May 2nd, 2014, uh, in the summer of 2014, a lot of people decided not to visit Odessa and they were kind of afraid of going to the area and, and, and therefore you had a lot of this uh, spa resorts being just deserted. And that's when the, the people from Donbass started to come in and that's why we had this opportunity, at least for a short period of time, yeah, a short, short period of time to accommodate some of, some of those people. So that, so that, was, um, that was interesting. Uh, the challenge uh, of uh, internally displaced persons in Ukraine is maybe less critical than it is in the, in the countries of South Caucasus because percentage-wise, in terms of if you look at the population of Georgia, and Azerbaijan, and Armenia, they had to deal with much bigger numbers there. Uh, in Ukraine, even if you talk about, let's say, 
million people in Ukraine, maybe even less, you know, who knows. But for the country of 45 million people, it's probably not such a huge deal. But still, it's becoming a big problem. And then, of course, the state perhaps is quite often is not capable, not ready to provide any assistance. Uh, uh, the, the, the most important level there is not even like a centrally coordinated policy on the issues coming from Kyiv, but the, the, the pressure that is on the local government bodies like regional state administrations, maybe even sitting councils, and they all now have specific divisions there for, to, for dealing, to deal with internally displaced persons. But, um, you know, the policy, the guidelines is often lacking, the expertise, the experience in dealing with these issues is lacking, and the right attitude of trying to help those people is also quite lacking. So that's uh, important. And then, of course, the NGOs are trying to help. Uh, Ukrainian NGOs, uh, you know, people coming from outside of Ukraine. A good friend of mine just moved to Severodonetsk and she's working for Norwegian Refugee Council, for instance, which has a big office there and helping ID Ukrainian IDPs. So a lot of people are beginning to understand that we're not having this as a temporary situation, unfortunately. It looks like a lot of those people are going to be there for a while, even if we assume that somehow soon, and fortunately, that would be the case, that Ukraine would be capable of uh, resuming control over Donbass. Uh, and returning the Donbass into the fold of the rest of Ukraine, then it doesn't mean that all those people would immediately uh, like to return. First of all, there is a devastation there, and uh, many of them wouldn't have a place to return to. Uh, but then the second of all, they would still probably uh, think twice or even more times in terms of whether I should actually go back to that region or not. So I guess the Ukrainians should uh, do a better job, I suppose, uh, in terms of government and society. Uh, of uh, familiarizing uh, ourselves with this new challenge that we're facing in, uh, uh, in uh, internally displaced persons. Thank you.